Wales is the same thing as you have on Friday the night. So that would mean that there's a metaphysical composition in the Okay, because that is a, it's, that isn't Allah's essence according to Muslims. And I don't uh, let me let me be more precise as well with what I'm saying. Because most Muslims don't know this, because we're talking about theology uh -huh. or what they would describe as kalam. Okay? Yeah. And most Muslims, the mundane, the normal day Muslims, have no idea about kalam. Yeah. The scholars themselves say, don't te teach them or don't talk about the kalam because it will cause too much problems. I, I know, but this, this, is, this is problematic, right? Yeah. Like, if you just say, we don't want to talk about this, that just means we're not going to teach you guys this because we don't want you to leave the religion because yeah. there's problems entailed in this, right? And the, pro the problem is, if you say there's a real distinction between the attributes of God, then those attributes can't be identical to the whole of God. And if what a part is, is just something less than the whole, then it constitutes what it means to be a part to say that Allah has really distinct attributes. And that's the problem. See, the problem that, yeah, I think the problem that we're having right here is, I'm not Muslim by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just here to objectively look at what Muslims, what the theology teaches. Yeah. And I don't think the theology teaches that there's parts and holes. I think oh. there is there is one thing which is there called the that, which is the essence of Allah. Yeah. And then there is something else called okay, the yeah. attributes. So, so what, what I'm getting at, I'm not saying that their theology teaches this. I'm yeah. saying that this is the conclusion of their philosophy, right? Okay. So it's like a Muslim saying Christians believe in free gods. Obviously, we don't believe in free gods. But they're just trying to say that what you believe in tells that there's free gods. Now, obviously, that's not true. but that's what they're trying to argue. What I'm trying to argue is that this set of beliefs leads to the belief that God is composed of parts, right? That's what I'm saying. And the fact of the matter is, is that Sunni theologians and scholars do teach that there's a real distinction between Allah's attributes. And that's all you need to be able to say, this belief leads to God being made up of parts. But this is not a specifically Muslim problem. Like you had this internal debate within Christianity as well, like about, about divine simplicity, back and forth. Like and that's why divine simplicity Persisi is the way to go, man. So, it's the way well, to go. Would agree, right? So, are I mean, a lot of Shia Muslims like this? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, that's why they shouldn't be Sunnis. They sh if they're going to be consistent, they should be Shias or, or Christians. The Christian God. Uh -huh. Doesn't the Christian God have attributes? Okay, so what we say about God is that He's identical to His attributes. So think about white light passing through a prism, right? Yep. White light is one single uh, light. It's one single wavelength of light. It passes through the prism and then you see multiple colors. This is in a way analogous to how we can think about God's attributes. So God is one simple substance, right? God is simple. There's no real distinction between his attributes for us. They're all identical to each other. But when we think about it in our human minds, there's a virtual distinction, meaning the way we think about it, there's going to be a difference between these attributes, but in reality, there's no difference there. So that's the position of divine simplicity. And that means that God has no parts. That's perfectly consistent. For you, God has attributes, right? One. And those attributes are distinct. No, no, no. no. They're, those attributes are only distinct virtually, but not so in actuality. So you're saying they're distinct for human comprehension, but not distinct for... Yeah, not for distinct in reality. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So how do you, so how do you, how do you right differentiate there? that between the Muslims then? Okay, because the Muslims, what they're saying is they're not just saying it's a virtual distinction between the attributes. They're saying it's a real yeah. distinction. Yeah. Exactly. So they're okay, saying so there's a real distinction between the, these attributes. What's the difference? What's the, virtu what's the virtual distinction and the real distinction? Okay, so a, a real distinction is just that which maps onto extra mental reality, right? So for example, this finger is really distinct from this finger here. Yeah. But a virtual distinction is just something that's only distinct in thought. It's only distinct in the way you think about it, but in actuality, it's the same thing. Okay. So, but you're saying they're distinct virtually for Christians. Yeah, only but virtual. Only reality. Yeah. Because yeah, but, in, but, in, but in extra mental reality, these attributes aren't distinct. So, are you telling me that God's attribute of being love, his attribute yes. of love, is also the same as his attribute of a destroyer? Well, we don't believe we don't believe destroyers really like an attribute of God. Like destruction would could be described as like an effect from God's uh, divine will or whatever He wills, but it's not like an attribute of God. We're saying that all these attributes are identical, though. 
but it's just the way you think about it in your human mind, you're just going to comprehend them differently. Okay, let me let me let me let me go there. Let me let me do let me do polarity real quickly. Mm -hmm. So you have God as a creator and you have God as a destroyer, but you're saying that God as a destroyer doesn't exist. Well, destruction is within God's creation, so it's it's the same thing. Like God God destruction isn't like an attribute of God. It's not what if we're God destroys, <laughs> he now becomes a destroyer. That is an adjective, that is an attribute of him. Yeah, it, it's not if really God a, creates, he now becomes a creator. No, God and is he a tiny God is a tiny but isn't that the problem for the Muslims? How is Allah a merciful before he Yeah, create create yeah, creator and destroyer isn't really like attributes of God. He has the like ability to create, but God didn't necessarily have to create. There could have been a possible world in which God didn't create anything. Really? But how do you avoid like modal collapse? And oh, that's, a, that's a good question. Easy. Basically, okay. sufficient explanations don't entail what they explain. That's yeah. It. Okay. So let, let's, okay, let's put forth a syllogism of the modal collapse. Okay. okay. Premise one, God exists of absolute necessity. Premise, yeah. Premise one, God exists of absolute necessity. Premise two, God is identical to his act of creation. Therefore, God's creation is of absolute necessity. Yeah, now, yeah, we're going to say this is an in... Wait, wait, let, 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 me, let me explain why it doesn't follow. Right? So we're going to agree with the first two premises as Thomas, but we're just going to say that this is an invalid argument. And the way that we can show this is an invalid argument is when we use other forms of the same argument, it leads to false conclusions. For example, if I were to say to you, premise one, Eight is necessarily greater than seven. Premise two, the number of planets in our solar system is identical to eight. Conclusion, therefore, the number of planets in our solar system is necessarily greater than seven. It doesn't follow because there could have been four planets in the solar system. It could have been five. Yeah, so the argument is invalid. Okay, yeah. They're not like the planets are not identical to the number eight. That's exactly. where I would. So what is that? Necessity is not transitive. But the problem is for the vice president is if the will, if God's will is identical to God's essence, doesn't that mean that what what God wills becomes necessary? No, because no, necessity. No, divine, so is there going to be a distinction in God's divine act, like what things that He creates? Is there a real distinction? It's going to be. It's going to be a. Um, no, it will be. I think it will be, it will be a real distinction. Look, God is it. The, uh, this, this is it. The reason why it doesn't work and these modal collapse arguments has actually been completely debunked on by a guy called Joe Schmidt. The reason is is because God's divine act is not deterministic. Yes, it's, it's indeterministic. Indeterminist. It's indeterministic. Is it necessary? No, no, no. It's, no, God's it's, divine act. No, look. So it's, it's true it's that God can be necessary it. and that God can create. Isn't he identical to his act? God is identical to his act. Right, he's but pure act. His act is not deterministic. But it would. He, it, it would be yes. necessary. God, no, wait, 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 wait. If he's God, identical, no, 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 Christian, are you Christian? Yeah. No, no. God is identical to his act. What's the Christian? I think I think he's probably an EO. It's not deterministic. It's not indeterministic. Not so if it's indeterministic, it will right. entail a modal collapse. If it is deterministic, then it will. Yeah. So yeah exactly. Also, also this, then it would follow that the modal collapse. Non-denominational. Non-denominational. Non but yeah. Yeah. if you yeah. hold that God's divine, can I just say quickly, quickly? Quick, oh quick, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I love you guys. <laughs> you guys are literally like a, a breath of fresh air to speak a school now. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Even though you're speaking religion, you're talking philosophy at the same time, and I'm loving that. Go on. Yeah, I yeah, really perfect. want to understand, but to be honest, I'm not really catching all the all basically, things. Basically, yeah. look, yeah. let's say I'm a necessary being. Okay. Now, it's going to be true that what I create would also be necessary in, you know, in some sense that I created it. It's going to Your be necessary. Creation, necessary. So it's going to be necessary that I created it. But Listen, it's being I'm created. Loving it. I'm loving it. Yeah, it's necessary by I'm supposition, like not by absolute But it had to happen, right? No, no, no. No, no, no. God didn't have to create anything. Yeah, but let me let me stop the act. It's necessary. Yeah, but, it's, but the point is that God's so God's the divine act, that, that creation act, it doesn't obtain in all worlds. The point is that. It's something called rigid designation. If it's necessary, it should be not. It's something called rigid designation. When we have a sentence in English, what typically what happens is that we designate the, an object as the like the, the privileged thing in a sentence. So when I say, oh, like um, God exists in at least some possible worlds. Well, the That's thing not that, the same God I believe in. I know, I, believe I, know, I, know I know, I'm just trying to use it. Okay. Yeah, when I say God exists in, in some mm. possible worlds, what I'm saying, or, or, or if I say at least God exists in, in some possible worlds, what I'm saying is that what's being rigidly designated here is God. Right? Okay. 
okay. and not the possible Whoa. worlds. So there are going to be some things that are going to remain true in some contexts of what is going to be originally designated, and it's, not, it's going to be false in other contexts. For example, Superman. Superman has a secret identity. Sorry, Clark Kent has a secret identity called Superman, right? <laughs> Superman, Superman and Clark Kent are the same person. But if I ask you the question, does Lois Lane know that Clark Kent can fly? She'll so, say no. But if I ask you the question, does Lois Lane know that Superman can fly? She'll say no. But yes. they're identical. So Even though they are like, identical, the thing that's being rigidly designated is going to change. So this is, yeah, can we, can we, I have to just make some pauses here and there. Like, so, okay. So uh, I feel like, like when you talked about God being like, if you want to talk about God, we have to talk about something that exists in all possible worlds necessarily, right? Um, so please, well, yeah. don't don't take on that point. I wasn't saying. Okay, that so God we're, we're leaving that now. Look, look yeah. God is necessary and he exists in some possible worlds. He exists in all possible worlds. Yeah, he's just using okay. it as an example. But I'm just, I was just, what, what I'm trying to get you to understand is the reason why those model class arguments don't work is that it presupposes that God's divine act is deterministic and it's not. Yeah. It doesn't have to be deterministic. But it's necessary. God's divine act is necessary only because he has created. Yeah. But he it's, didn't have it's, to create. It's necessary by a supposition. Create. So if you read the Summa Theologia question 19, I think it's article 3, Aquinas will tell you that there's different ways in which things can be necessary. It can be absolutely necessary, nominally necessary, and necessary by supposition. He's saying that God's act of creation is necessary. Creation is necessary in this sense by supposition, okay. which is basically just meaning to say, as long as God creates, creation is necessary, but it's suppositionally necessary. Similarly to if I sit down, I'm necessarily sat down by supposition, but I could stand up. That's the sense in which creation would be necessary, but it's not going to be absolutely necessary. Okay, so does God's divine act have to create? No. It doesn't. No. It doesn't. But it's, it's, it's not an act that. if it doesn't act. Right? A, no, that's the point. God's divine but does it need act, to create? It doesn't to have to actual. create. <laughs> So, so are you saying the act can exist without acting? So God is God is eternally so, the creator. So because God so, has God has one divine act. So you, divine you have, act to, you have to explain to him what act, with, what act and potency is. No, no, we're not, it's, not, he it's, thinks, not no, it's, it's not act and potency. No, it's not act and potency, bro. He thinks act is like you have to. No, have there, there's no like, potency in God. There's no potency. No potency. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. What we're saying is that what we're saying is that look, this is what this is the argument is trying to say that God's divine act being identical to God is necessary in what it creates but that doesn't follow because the, the, ne the, the necessity operator is, is not transitive it doesn't follow over it's true that God is necessary and that yeah. in, in him being identical to his divine act his divine act is necessary but his divine act in creating things that thing the, the object that, it, that which it creates is not deterministic also what well, one small point I'd just like to add Scholars like Chris Tomaszewski, Stephen Nems, people like this that defend divine simplicity against the modal collapse, have actually also offered an argument against um, uh, theistic personalism, which leads them also to the modal collapse, right? So he parodies this argument. He calls this the two quoque objection. So you could say God is the um, God necessarily exists. You would agree with this? Yes. God well, is. I mean, I I, I I want to say that God transcends all our categories including necessity. Oh, okay apophatically god necessarily exists though right well i mean if you're going to be strictly apophatic then i'm not supposed to say you know what what god like i'm, I'm not if i'm supposed to be strictly apophatic i'm not supposed yeah, to say but we're, god we're, is we're just necessary. saying we're just saying when we say god exists necessarily we can just say for the second argument yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree god okay is necessary, okay sure. okay god necessarily exists um god is identical to the creator therefore necessarily there is a creator but you see how obviously that doesn't follow from from that because the form of argument is invalid. So, so perhaps we could flip it around. So maybe you could try to show how God actually has free will. Then, like, do you believe? No. Okay. Okay. So, when we say that God has intentionality, we need to be very careful with this. Okay. We we don't mean God has intentionality in a univocal sense, but we need we mean it in an analogical sense. So, for example, when we have intentionality, we have different brain states. We have different states in which our consciousness might change. Right? We change because we're humans, but God does not change. So, when we say God has intentionality, we're not going to univocally mean it in the same sense that we mean for humans like you and me. When we say God has intentionality, we're going to mean it in an analogical sense, which just means, in a sense, it's not univocal, nor is it equivocal. So, for example, if I say 
the wine is good. George is a good man. There's a similarity between the way I'm using good, but it's also different, right? So we're using it in an analogical sense. And the way that we're saying God analogically has intentionality is this. God has the power to create, God created a possible world whilst he had the power to create alternative possible worlds. And in that sense, he has intentionality. Because I could ask you this, right? If I were to ask you, why does God create this world over another, right? We're eventually going to have to posit either some difference in the divine essence which makes him want to create another world over another or we're going to have to deny something called the difference making principle and what the difference making principle is is it's just a principle that says whenever there's a difference in the effect there necessarily must be a difference in the cause and we're just going to deny that and then divine simplicity just works under that model but you guys would also have the same arg problem if you deny divine simplicity as well so i want to say that I, you know, I could be wrong about many things, but right now I want to say that God, most fundamentally, like I, it, I have to have a strict apophatic approach to what God is. Yeah. Most, funda most fundamentally, so I, I'm not gonna say God is. But but you like, can analogically absolute, predicate things. I'm not gonna of say God, God yeah. is absolutely simple. I'm not gonna say God is necessary. Cause I, yeah. Because I do think, at least from from what I understand, because I like, I want to understand your perspective, but I don't understand yeah. everything. But from the way I see it, it, it does seem to lead some kind of necessitarianism if we if we kind of establish, like if we, if we try to like identify, for, like this is what the most fundamental principle is, it seems hard then to kind of make room well, for how everything that follows from this principle doesn't, you know, become as necessary as this first Yeah, I, I, I don't think that follows because I think the argument is invalid and I think okay. it relies on presuppositions that the classical theists could just deny it. And I would actually argue all theists should deny this principle if they're not going to be necessitarians. And that principle is the difference-making principle which I mentioned to you earlier, right? Mm -hmm. If I were to say to you, why does God create one possible world over another, even as uh, I'm getting Eastern Orthodox vibes, but you could be anything. So I'm, I mean, I'm just sometimes I lean there. I'm, I'm okay. quite, I'm used, sometimes I'm quite. I mean, I am generally interested. In, yeah. And, and so I look into Eastern yeah. sometimes. So if I were to ask you, as either EO or whatever sect you are, why does God create this world over another? What would your answer to that be? Uh, it would. It would be because of his uh, truly free free will decision. Okay, but how, how does he have that free will? Because the the point is right. How he has free will. Well, yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of like I know very little about the Scotus. Perhaps I'm misrepresenting them, the, uh, the, the Scotus yeah. totally. But from what I've heard, maybe you you know more about Scotus. But wouldn't they say that like there is a primacy of the will of God? So I'm kind of like. Well, I, I'm I'm not Scotus. I'm a Thomist, okay. but. But I do what? think that there might be something irreducible to the will of God that is yeah. like going like beyond the will of God. You know, might, yeah. might be I, I would affirm that yeah. God has a will, mm. but what I'm going to say is that what we mean by God can freely create is just that God creates a possible world whilst he has the power to bring about another possible world, right? Because if we're going to say that there's a reason as to why God creates one world over another, that reason is going to be grounded within the essence of God. Which would mean that we're going to have to posit God, that there are accidents I in God's that. essence. I think I might reject that. Principle. I think ultimately it would be grounded in the the energies. Well, the, the you know the most fundamental principle which I have to have a strict apophatic approach to. So I cannot say it's a, it's an essence even. I cannot say it's a. It's but, but okay, it's, even as someone who apophatically, because also in our tradition mm -hmm. we hold to apophaticism, right? Mm -hmm. We hold to um, uh, what's the saint that the, the saint that holds apophaticism a lot? Um, Dionysius. Dionysius. Yes, the era pay guy. Yeah. Okay. So even in our tradition, Saint Thomas Aquinas even quotes Dionysius the Area pay guy, right? We hold to apophatic theology as well. Mm -hmm. But what we say is that we can predicate some things of God something, as yeah. long as it's in an analogical sense. I because might grant, I might yeah, be because e well. I think even you would have to grant that, right? Because if we can only predicate things of God in an equivocal sense, mm -hmm then essentially everything we're saying about God is meaningless, right? There must be some likeness to what we're saying, to what God is. Otherwise, it's just me saying blah, 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 right? Well, the, the thing about language, the way I see it, is like language, let, like words we're using, it's, it's, they, it's like it is uh, essentially symbols and images. Yeah. And every word and every image, the meaning of it goes beyond itself. That's how it can be understood and recognized. Like it has a signifier beyond itself. And I think, that's, I think that that's how we actually can say that we can know God without being able to fully describe Him. We can even encounter and experience God, but still recognizing that when we try to 
even perhaps make sense of it you, using human language, there's going to mm -hmm. be limitations to it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a that, helpful yeah. and important principle to keep yeah. you this, so, this negative theology. Kind of yeah, I, for, for the record, I think apophatic theology is valid so long as we hold to analogical predication as well, right? Okay. So I think that you can describe things using uh, something negative. For example, when we say God is immaterial, we are describing what God is by negating something about him that he is material, right? Similarly to when I chip away at a statue, I'm revealing the form of what I want the statue to be by chipping away at it. But I also believe that there should be analogical predication there. Would, would you agree with that? Like, the, like there's some of affirmations we can make. Uh -huh. uh, well, the, well, I, well, we have to qualify it then, I think, then. Like, are, are, am I making affirmations about what God is, you know, God qua God, like God is in himself? Yeah. Or so, am I saying what, what I affirm about symbolically? Because, yeah. I mean, ultimately, language, I don't think language can escape its symbolic nature, basically. Yeah. So uh, there's no, there, I don't, there's probably not a one-to-one -one correspondence, you know. I, I, I would say it's problematic yeah. if we can't say that we can analogically predicate things of God. I would agree, we can't univocally say anything about God, okay? I mean, but, we can re I mean, but analogically, like an, an, an analogy is supposed to be a representation, right? Isn't it? There, yeah, it, it's, there's yeah. a certain likeness to... A similar, like between, a, a symbolism. Yeah, there's a certain likeness between image, God and what he's yeah. revealed to us, right? Mm. But it, he's not univocally like that, right? It's just analogically. Mm. Similarly to when I say the wine is good and um, George is a good man. When I'm using the term good there, it's not in the exact same sense, but nor is it in a completely different sense. It's in an, I'm analogically predicating it of the two. Yeah, right? I definitely want to, like, I also want to affirm, like, uh, we can, like, if, as long as we recognize that the language we're using, it's mm -hmm. images, representation, but I, like, you know, in the Bible, you know, God said, like, don't make images of, of like, don't, this is, you were forbidden to make images of God, and I think we. This is good to kind of recognize that. Well, no, it, it, it says don't make any graven image, which, which I, is pointing towards well, idols, right? Well, I mean, there's probably a different way to interpret it, but the way I interpret well, that is okay. actually in a helpful sense. Like when we actually get stuck in these kind of philosophical, uh, you know, circles and stuff. Like I think what's ultimately going to help us to perhaps, you know, like that's it, it, uh, this like Wittgenstein's question, like, like how how can we stop philosophy, right? Like, and I think. Negative theology, apoph apophatic theology, might be a, like, a good candidate for that. To actually, like, for someone who has the desire to be able to like stop overthinking about God and and like and be able to like acknowledge that God is, you know, God transcends our language and even our reasoning, and be fine with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think though that we can do this as Thomists as well, because okay. even Saint Thomas Aquinas, from the Summa Theologiae, quotes Dionysius the Areopag guy. He affirms some apophatic theology, but what he just says is we can't we can't univocally say anything about God, mm -hmm. but we can analogically predicate things of him. And I, my problem yeah. is if we can't anal if we can't say anything about God analogically, then we can't say anything about him at all if it's just equivocal. That that's my my problem. I'm to be having honest, there. I'm not the, like the best read up on these different terms like mm -hmm. analogical and uh, equ yeah. equivocal. Uh, but I do, I, I mean, I, I think there have to be some kind of bridge. Yeah, I do there is some something kind of Something is communicated. But I think perhaps our deep understanding of some of these words might even happen in some yeah. kind of level that goes beyond words. Like, I think so our being is, you know, escape, I mean, transcends language as well. Mm -hmm. uh, like, there's, I mean, I think, like, how can you, like, wouldn't you agree that, like, the fact that we have a conscious experience, you know, the, the experience of the color red, you know, like between two Christian brothers, right? Because okay, I would yeah. still consider you a, a Christian even though you take EED. Well, I'm I, sure you would probably still consider me one as like a Thomist, right? Well, I want to be open-minded about like, okay, the yeah. simplicity and the e, like EED. I, I don't have yeah. like a definite Okay, uh, so my, my problem with EED is I'm not going to call it polytheism, but I mm -hmm. think it hinges on the line there. But it depends. Yeah, that's, that's a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. So, let me ask how you this. Do you, how, how do we make them yeah. one? Yeah. yeah. Does St. Gregory Par Palamas hold that there's a real distinction between essence and energy? Like, so I'm, I'm far from like an expert on, I actually read quite a little from him. I mean, okay. I did, I did uh, get the, his book, The Triads, have a look at yeah. it a little bit. Uh, but like, I'm, I'm like, I'm probably not the best. I'm far, like, I don't even know if I can make that definite. Decision. Like, this, he said this, he said that. Okay, yeah. But I know he says things like, there is a famous quote where he says, like, God is beyond knowing and even unknowing. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know, they, they have the, he was into that, what is called Hesse, 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 uh, you know, where the kind of mystical East yeah. Orthodox, where, where I think they do heavily emphasize uh, negative theology and mm. like God being beyond words. Yeah, mysticism and that. Yeah, my, my problem is if there's a real distinction mm -hmm. between God's essence and his energies, and these are uncreated energies, they don't depend on God. Mm -hmm. My problem is, is you now have two uncreated, necessary, independent things, which is essentially two gods in, in my view of how things go, which is why I want to avoid this perhaps, essence energy distinction. Perhaps, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like guessing, but I think the, 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 the approach to in the method in which they would say though, that thing might, it, it might be based on negative theology. Like perhaps mm -hmm. they're not making a, like a positive affirmation that you know, the essence of God is, you know, in relation to the energies. I mean, perhaps they would even deny that. Perhaps the way they, go, they, they reach to that conclusion is to actually say, the essence of God is not like anything we can think of, uh -huh. including the energies of God. So it's, perhaps yeah. that's... But we, we can, we, the point is though, we can know certain things about God's essence that he's revealed to us, and we can know certain things about his energies which you guys say has been revealed to us through the saints and the church etc now you know when you say you guys like i'm, I'm not oh even, sorry I'm sorry not you're, official. you're not officially eo like i'm, I'm like non-denominational yeah. kind of looking at things you know no sorry it's because i get it's because i get a strong eo vibe <laughs> oh, okay, sorry okay okay well it's all right it's yeah all right. no worries no worry. <laughs> sorry i mean um e even yeah even eos right that's what i meant so we we have we can describe some things about what right even under apophaticism, right? Do you think, do you think there's, if, okay, so do you think there's uh, there's nothing that escapes our language when it comes to God's being? Nothing that can can you explain? Well, you said like there's at least something we can say about essence. Yeah. But isn't there something about God in which we can say absolutely nothing? Like that's what I kind of perhaps want to occur. Mm. I, I'm I'm not sure about that because I think you know. If it's intelligible, you can you can say something about it. But I, I mean, at least I analogically that's, speaking. And I think that that could, from my perspective, that, that would be fine. Like if it's not intelligible. But I'm saying, perhaps we have to move away from, you know, intelligible reasoning and our cognitive reasoning. I, I think we should only stick way. to intelligibility because. Okay, here's my perhaps problem. Perhaps God right? wants to free us from that. Okay, so <laughs> here's my problem. I have the same problem when the Muslims when they do this, right? Okay. It's called. Um, uh, we can use it as a tool, but we shouldn't be trapped in yeah, it. Yeah. So when the Muslims do it, it's called tafweed, right? Okay. And I think sometimes some EOs do it. Not all EOs, but some EOs do it, right? So when I ask a Muslim, what does it mean that Allah descends? They're gonna say Allah descends in a way that befits His we Majesty. Don't how, right? We don't yeah. know how. We don't know how. We don't know how, right? But essentially then, what descent means is it's a non-cognitive statement. There is no information that I've accessed when you've told me that God descends. So now if you tell me that God has energies, God has an essence, but you can't tell me like anything about God's energies, then essentially what you're saying is God has a blah, 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 right? It, it's unintelligible but to just, understand. Just on that point, like, but what if it's, what if like God's descending is irreducible like you cannot explain it in any other way but however it could that the truth of that could still be communicated for example you know if i ask you like explain to me the color red like you the truth of the color red or like it has been communicated to you you know what the color red is but if perhaps the sound colorblind and i ask you like yeah what, what do you mean by the color red you know how, yeah. do you, how could couldn't i have the same critique well, I, you, could, like, I could try and like scientifically explain red and stuff but yeah, well, regardless of the point they right, give me the knowledge yeah. of the color red yeah. right i mean but what, the, 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 the thing is though when we're saying that like god has x y and z and then when someone asks what is x y and z and someone says x y and z is just what befits god's majesty then essentially we're not saying anything about god when we say he has x y and z we, we could for example change those terms out for any other term that you want to fit there and it would have the same meaning because there's no meaning present. But I'm saying it could be meaningful even if you cannot explain it in other terms like the color red for example. The experience of the color red. You can use scientific language like the, the, the what do you mm -hmm. call the electrons or whatever the photons yeah. hits your eyes but that, that won't give you the understanding of the experience of color red. So if someone yeah. says God has revealed to me the experience of color red or something like but, that. But I do, do think you, that yeah, but I do think that even in the EO tradition, you guys do make 
so, sorry, not you guys. I keep saying you guys. I could be an EO. For he he could be an EO, but we, we don't know. I, I'm just saying that within that tradition, there are certain things that are said about God. For example, Palamas does say certain things about God. For example, that God has these energies which are distinct from his essence. Whether it's a virtual distinction or a real distinction, I'll leave up to any viewers or whoever wants to look over this. But if it's a real distinction, my problem is, is I think that that is dangerously on the verge of polytheism. If it's a virtual distinction, it's a bit more calm. But if it's a real one, then I have, I have a big problem with that. And I, I think the way, the way would, because the way I think the problem is framed, they, I think it rests on this uh, uh, bin, binary system. Like I, either it's this or it's that. Like, just to point out, like uh, otherwise it would be a contradiction. And I think the response from the EU, EEO would probably be, well, God transcends those distinctions. And you could say it's contradictory. Uh, I mean, and they would say, well, well God, I, God transcends. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if they would say that though, because for example, people like Jay Dyer, you are, he's a very popular I've EO guy. To him, yeah, yeah. I, I think he would say there's a real distinction between the essence yeah, and the energy. Yeah, but I think he, I've also seen him heavily critique this kind of uh, di uh, di uh, dialect that uh, you know Western Christianity rests on. Uh, he like, uh, yeah, so. I think I think they would also maintain that that some, something like that, like uh, God yeah. transcends our dialects and dichotomies. Uh, but would you would you uh, be willing to affirm that that God? I I would be willing to affirm that God does transcend us in some sense. Yes. Even our understanding. Or... Uh, in in a univocal sense, God does transcend our understanding. Okay. But there, God has there's a likeness that we can understand God by. So we can just analogically predicate things of God in our tradition. Yeah, but I, I think there's definitely things God can reveal to us or ha has revealed to us that we're supposed to understand. But, we're, but I mean, to some extent, but we're not. I mean, what, does, what do we mean by understanding? You know, like, I don't think understanding should be everything. Like, I don't know, maybe it's, it gets a bit deep. But do you, Un Understanding yeah. isn't everything. But when we make a positive affirmation about something and then we say, well, that's something we don't know what it means, then essentially we haven't really affirmed anything. We're just affirming a meaningless statement. That, that, that's my sort of problem with that, right? Well, you know, if I, if I had an experience of God that I cannot make, like if I recognize that this is just transcends any of my vocabulary, anything like any of my knowledge, I cannot even describe what it is, but I, I, I still know my experience. I know I had an experience. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do think there are things that, as humans, we will, we won't be, we can't comprehend. Mm -hmm. But there are things that we are able to like apprehend yeah. and describe in a certain sense, right? Yeah. Perhaps we agree more than we think. You know? Yeah, we probably <laughs> do agree yeah. more than we think. After all, we're both Christians anyway. Yeah. So yeah. I might have to get going, but it would okay, be no worries, nice man. To talk to you. If Okay, so this has been like a friendly conversation between a Thomist, someone that believes in divine simplicity, and someone that's a bit skeptical about it, with may maybe some EO leaning positions, maybe not. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure. Yeah, something you're, like you're looking into things, right? Yeah. Looking into things. That, that's good. I could be so, wrong about so, things. Yeah. So we started off the conversation talking about the modal collapse argument against divine simplicity, which is basically when we talk about modality, we're just talking about possible worlds and necessary things. And the modal collapse objection just basically says, if God is divinely simple, then God must necessarily create this possible world. Me, Rico, SY, we were debating against that point and we said that modal collapse is actually an invalid argument because we can present other forms of the same argument which do not reach a valid conclusion, such as the planets analogy that was used earlier. So also uh, the modal collapse argument was I relies on presuppositions such as the difference making principle that the classical theists can reject and we also talked a little bit about the essence energy distinctions and why i think i have a problem about that and why maybe you might not and we also talked a bit about apophatic theology it's been a good discussion man yeah, yeah. it's been a good discussion yeah so and, uh, yeah yeah like i don't know i would probably say like yeah at the moment i'm quite interested in negative theology mm -hmm. but I'm, i probably have to go home and read the bible and, and see if jesus uh, and endorses negative theology. <laughs> well, look, no. if, you want, if you really want to know a lot about like um, yeah. the reasons why modal collapse arguments don't work, a guy called Joe Schmidt. Yeah, perfect uh, guy. What's, what's it? Christopher Thomas something? Christopher Tomaszewski. What's the other what's guy? Stephen uh, Nemes. No, uh, I think Stephen Nemes actually denounced yeah. divine simplicity. Is he denounced it now? Well, he has lots of papers uh, against modal collapse. 
But anyway, guys, that's been your boy Thomas and your boy. All right, see you. All right, it's been a good one, man. Take Catch care. you in a bit. Robert, you want to promote your channel, anything, social media, Twitter? Um, I don't really have any social media right now. Maybe in the future, this summer, after exams, everything's been done. I might hop on the YouTube vibe. I might hop on there, so you'll be able to catch me on there. But all I got to say, guys, Thomistic Metaphysics is based. All right, in a bit. <laughs>